This evening we're back to the text that we were in last Lord's Day evening. That would be 1 Corinthians 15. I'm uh, hoping that I'm starting in verse 20. Okay, it looks good. And going through verse 26, was that where I was going to end? Okay. I keep forgetting to transcribe what I've selected for the scripture reading <laughs> to uh, my notes to know where I'm going. But uh, I think that should encompass everything we want to look at. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 20 through verse 26. Again, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Paul writes to the church at Corinth. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. May the Lord bless again his word to our hearing this evening. I think uh, I may have told you that um, this particular passage that we're focusing on, 1 Corinthians 15:25. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet is perhaps one of the most encouraging passages of all of scripture. And when I was uh, asked what I thought that it meant when I was being examined in committee uh, 20 years ago or so when, when I was uh, being examined for ordination, I didn't see the implications of it. But that's what I'm hoping that we will see this evening, that those things will be brought out and perhaps systematically will grow on us what, uh, what this is actually saying, because it can give to us a great deal of optimism regarding our future, uh, not only in the distant future, but also in the near future for us. Now, last week, we were looking at some of those reasons why we can be optimistic about the future. We shouldn't have a defeatist attitude, which is often what is conveyed in many churches today, uh, those especially of, of premillennial bent and especially those of a dispensational premillennial bent and I might even say some along, uh, that are in the Amil camp. Uh, I would say the dispensationalist is more pessimistic. They believe things are just running downhill. At least with the, with the Amil you do have sort of a neck and neck kind of a struggle. But there is another position that indicates that things are going to go up. And of course if that is the case, um, that will certainly create a great deal of optimism for us as we seek to do the Lord's will. Now, what are some of the reasons why we can be optimistic? Well, the first thing is the fact that Jesus is reigning now, not uh, in a limited sense, as even I think uh, dispensational premillennialists would, would agree that he is reigning, but they wouldn't say he is reigning with the kind of power and authority that he will reign someday when he returns again. The point we were looking at is we don't have to wait for Jesus Christ to return for him to take up his power and his rule because he has had that. He has been ruling as the mediator from the time of his ascension. And of course, that took place after he rose again from the dead. After the 40 days, he appeared to his disciples and he ascended into heaven. He sat at the right hand of God waiting from that time on until all his enemies are a footstool for his feet. Now we saw that uh, the fact that he is reigning now means that as far as the future is concerned, which is what we were focusing on last week, that when you die, that you will go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and you will rule and reign with him in heaven. I believe that that's what Revelation 20 is speaking about where it talks about uh, that vision of, of Christ ruling and reigning for the thousand years and those who uh, followed him and those who suffered martyrdom during the 70 AD judgment upon Israel are reigning with him. So will you, if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for whatever is left of the millennium, which is what we're currently in now. It's something we looked at also, I believe, 
last time. That's certainly something to look forward to, that you will rule and reign with Jesus Christ over this world. The Bible actually goes on to say that we will be participating with him in the judgment as well. Now, we also saw, secondly, that his reign will end when all of his enemies have been subdued under his feet. And when that has taken place, he will come again, as we've just read, to vanquish the very last enemy, which is death. Now, not only does that mean that the second coming, far from signaling the beginning of his reign, actually signals the end of his reign, because he is coming to raise the dead and to vanquish death in that way, and that is when his reign will end. But it also gives us something to look forward to. Remember that because Christ's coming is, well, this is something we still have to look forward to or look, look at in the future. Because his coming is a little ways off, every one of us here is going to experience death. That is the separation of the soul from the body. That's something we're not used to. That's something that's unnatural. That's something that is the result of the fall. But Jesus Christ is going to come and he is going to reverse that. By the way, let me just interject here that even though we die, our our condition will still be better off once we're dead than we are now alive because our souls will be with the Lord and we will be with him in that world of joy and happiness and we will be perfect still going to be better than what we're experiencing here, but it's going to get even better when the Lord comes and vanquishes death, raises our bodies, transforms them into his own glorious image in the sense that we will have glorified bodies like his and be reunited with our souls and then to enter in to the new heavens and the new earth where there isn't any more of this, this weakness, this sickness, this aging, this fatigue, this tiredness, Nothing but perfection and perfect happiness to spend eternity with our Lord. Jesus is coming again to raise us, to reunite us with our bodies that we may enjoy that blessedness of the new heavens and the new earth forever. And that's something that we certainly have to look forward to. But we want to look at one more thing. And that is, what do we have to look forward to in this world, or at least now, perhaps we might say in the nearer future and not so far into the future, as the result of this ongoing subjection of our Lord's enemies under his feet. Now, I know that when we broach the subject, the first thing we're going to think is, well, we're going to talk about something that maybe I don't agree with, but I think that we're going to look at some things that I hope we can all agree on and perhaps maybe something that maybe we don't all agree as strongly on. <laughs> So there's two things that I think that we can look forward to because of Christ's reign now and because of the subjection of his enemies under his feet. The first thing that I think we all agree on is the fact that his reigning now and the fact that his enemies are being subdued under him will give us the confidence that God will, in fact, work out everything that he has intended to work out. He will bring it to its completion because nothing can stand in the way of the Lord. We might say this is more of the, um, uh, the effect of his reigning with absolute power and authority. What difference does that make now? But secondly, and perhaps we may disagree on this point, the fact that the Father is systematically subduing Christ's enemies under his feet should also give us the confidence that things will improve dramatically in this world before he returns. And again, we might differ on the degree that that will take place. I understand that even those of an amill persuasion can be optimistic. Uh, that's, I suppose, possible. If they become too optimistic, then they move into the post-mill realm, and where that exactly, you know, where one crosses into the other, I don't know. But that's what we're going to look at. First of all, the fact that he is reigning now can give us confidence that everything is going to work out as the Lord has planned. He is reigning now, and he will reign until all of his enemies are subdued under his feet. Now, remember that this reign of our Lord Jesus Christ is something that the Father promised the Son uh, years before he came into the world. 
As a matter of fact, we looked at that, although we didn't look at that particular point, a little while ago in the Gospel of Mark. Remember that Jesus was um, being asked questions in the temple. And then he finally, he, he thought, well, I'll ask them one of my own. And when he asked this, it really put them to, to, to uh, well, put them to shame. But they were silent because they didn't know how to answer him. Jesus said, if the Christ is the son of David, then why does David say in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If the Messiah, who is the son of David, uh, is, well, actually, if, if this is the one being referred to, why does David call his own son Lord when the son is always inferior to the father? The father is always greater. Well, the point is, of course, because Jesus Christ is more than just a man. The Messiah was to be more than a man. He is the God-man. He is the Lord of the universe. And that's why the Lord says to, David says, my Lord. But remember this, the point of what he's saying here as well. This was one of the things that the Father had promised to give Jesus Christ for his work of redemption. Sit at my right hand until I put all your enemies under your feet. Now, Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, that because Jesus Christ was willing to humble himself, being in the form of God and not thinking it robbery to be considered equal with God, he humbled himself and came into this world as a man and humbled himself even to the point of undergoing the cursed death on the cross. And the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Jesus Christ is willing to become a curse for us in order to save us from our sins if we will just trust in him. It doesn't happen automatically. We have to trust him. But this is what he was willing to do. And because of that, Paul says this, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What's Paul talking about here? Except the very thing that he's telling us in 1 Corinthians 15.25, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Jesus is reigning now, and during this time of his reign, his enemies are being subdued under his feet. Now that is a reason for us to be optimistic, I believe, about the near future. First, if he is reigning with this absolute authority, we can know that Jesus has the authority and the power to rule and overrule everything that is happening in this world, both for the good of his church in general, as well as for the good of you and me in particular or individually, because there is nothing that can stand in the way of our Lord. He has absolute power and authority. The Bible says he's ruling over the nations right now, and what that means is not that he's just sitting there watching them. If, they don't, if he doesn't like what they're doing, he clobbers them. But he's basically in control of what's going on right now. Everything that is happening is happening because it is his will. Now, remember, this, this isn't, doesn't mean that the nations are obeying his commandments, uh, his revealed will, though that's something that we'll, we'll look at perhaps in just a little bit to see whether or not that's actually going to happen. But they are doing exactly what the Lord wants them to do. He is in control. And as we know, the Bible says he is using even the evil of wicked men to advance his cause. Now that's the reason why the world has not yet been successful in destroying itself. The Lord is not going to allow the world to end until he has finished using it for the good of his church in general. As I said, he rules and overrules all things for the good of his church. That's the reason, by the way, why the Cold War, as you recall, uh, those of us who were alive during that time, was that imminent threat that was always there of nuclear holocaust, that uh, somehow you know, the United States and Russia, the two nuclear powers, were going to uh, finally escalate uh, their, their enmity toward one another until they launched nuclear bombs, in which case they would destroy most of the world, if not all of the world. Well, if we had only trusted the Lord more, 
and realized that his work was not yet done for the, uh, the church in the, with this world, or at least he wasn't done with this world for his church, we wouldn't have had to be afraid. Because God still has more work to do in this world. He has more to gather. He has more of his kingdom to advance and more glory to give to his son. His enemies still have yet to be subdued. If we thought about this for a minute, uh, the fact that Russia was threatening us with nuclear holocaust meant that Christ had enemies that had yet to be subdued. The fact that they weren't subdued meant that they couldn't destroy the world because they had to be subdued before the world could be destroyed until this promise to our Lord Jesus Christ is fulfilled, the world cannot come to an end. The Lord is not going to allow man to destroy the world that he created for this very purpose. By the way, um, fear doesn't end with the Cold War. You know, Russia, the, the the walls come down and so forth, and you know, supposedly communism has come to an end there. I'm not sure if that's altogether true. But that doesn't mean the threat has ended. What's going on in North Korea? Uh, what's going on in the Middle East? There's always that concern uh, that some terrorist is going to get a hold of a nuclear bomb or that uh, North Korea is going to start some kind of a nuclear war because they're gaining uh, that capability. But you need to realize that they are no more capable of destroying the world than Russia was. The Lord is sovereign over all things. We do not need to be afraid. So if you're living in fear of those things, don't be afraid. God has a plan that isn't fulfilled yet. The fact that they're even threatening this shows that his plan isn't fulfilled because they haven't been subdued under the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ, which must take place before the world comes to an end. I hope you see the point there. By the way, the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign over all things means that we may also have confidence that whatever happens to us personally in our families, in our lives, in our households will also be overruled for our good because of that sovereignty. Now, we don't always know what Jesus Christ is doing when he brings these difficulties into our lives. But we do have a promise that he will work them together for good. Sometimes things do get fairly grim. Sometimes they do look very difficult. But I do believe that we can know that God is going to work these things together for good, that Jesus is going to work them together for good because he has promised that he would do that. And nothing can stand in his way. You can't stand in his way. The devils can't stand in his way. No man can stand in his way. Jesus will do what he has purposed to do because he has absolute power and authority. So I do believe that his reigning right now and the subjection of his enemies can give us confidence and can give us uh, optimism about our near future. But I also think it can help us with the more distant future. Because remember, as a believer, you never have any reason to despair of anything. You know that Jesus Christ is going to complete his purpose in this world. You know that when Jesus did battle with the enemy, with Satan in the wilderness, and overcame him and destroyed him, that he set in motion the end of his kingdom. Jesus has won the war that he has actually called us to fight as Christians, both for the world in general and for your soul in particular. And that means that basically everything that happens between now and the end of the world is really, we might say, just a mop-up operation. The kingdom of heaven will advance. The kingdom of the evil one will retreat. Uh, the Lord will eventually bring in the new heavens and the new earth. The old kingdom or the old heavens and the old earth will be destroyed. And he will bring in this new world of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. There is nothing that can stop him from doing that. I know sometimes we're tempted to think that, well, I hope, hopefully we don't hear, but I know Christians certainly do in, in the world when they don't understand just how uh, weak Satan is compared to God. I mean, they're not equal and opposing forces. There's no contest. 
God is infinitely stronger than all the powers of evil put together, all the powers of the world and everything that he has created. It is no contest for God. He will bring about everything he has purposed to bring about. That also means that if you are trusting Jesus Christ to save you and to bring you into that new heavens and that new earth, that you will be there. There is really nothing, as Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 8, nothing in heaven or earth that can possibly stop the Lord from bringing you there, at least if you're trusting in the Lord. I realize that's easy to say. Sometimes it's hard to apply to ourselves. I mean, we're talking about here assurance of whether or not we belong to the Lord. Uh, the problem is usually on our end rather than on God's end. I mean, we don't doubt that God can do these things. The question is whether or not he's going to do it for us. The struggle is whether or not we are genuine believers. So let me just say this really quickly, that if you love the Lord, if you truly love him, and you are walking in his ways, you are seeking to do all that he has called you to do because you love him and you love his ways, then you can know that you are trusting in the Lord and you will be there. But for those of you who struggle on the other end and you wonder whether or not this is really what God is going to do, is he really going to bring in a world like the one he describes in Scripture? Does he really have the power to do that? Does he intend to keep us and to take care of us and to love us forever? Well, do not doubt that that is what the Lord has intended because he can do and will do all that he has planned to do. Remember, this one who is reigning over us is no mere man. If he were, then we might have reason to worry. He is the God-man, which means he has, of course, that divine character that never wavers, that never changes, that certainly being God will never run out of power, that what he intends to do, he will do, which means that if you are trusting in the Lord, there is nothing in heaven or earth that will stop you from being in that place he has purposed to bring you. So again, we, we have reasons to be optimistic because of the reign of Christ and the fact that he has the promise that all his enemies are going to subdue we have reasons to be optimistic about the near future, and I think we can all agree on that. But there is an area perhaps where we may have a little less agreement, and that is the second point, that the Father will systematically, or the fact that the Father will systematically, or is systematically subduing Christ's enemies under his feet can give us confidence that things are going to change dramatically uh, in this world before Jesus Christ returns. I think I mentioned this last week, that there are things certainly to be optimistic about in the future. And even if we didn't have this particular promise, I mean, all the things that the Lord is giving to us are, are wonderful, and they're great, but I think, again, that there may be room for greater optimism before the Lord returns. It's very likely, from what the Scripture says, that the Lord is intending to allow some of these blessings of Christ's reign to break into history before the consummation, before the return of Christ. Now again, let me just draw your attention to the fact that Paul says that Jesus will reign until all his enemies are subdued under his feet. And again, I think it takes a while for this to kind of break into our understanding. When is this going to happen? When are his enemies going to be subdued under his feet? Well, Paul says, before he returns again, before the second coming, he must reign until all of his enemies are put under his feet. The last enemy is death. That is going to be vanquished when he returns again to raise the dead. This is going to be at his second coming. This is going to be at the end of his reign. This is going to be after all his other enemies have been systematically subdued under his feet. That must take place before he comes to subdue the last enemy. Now, I think that what our Lord is talking about here is a gradual subjection of his enemies under his feet, a subjection that began with his ascension into heaven. 
and his session or his being seated at the right hand of God. I think it included the subjection of the Jews that were converted through the evangelism of the disciples and the Gentiles also who willingly bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ as they responded to the gospel. I believe it also included his judgment against Israel in 70 AD. That was a part of the subjection of his enemies. Jesus Christ said in one of his parables, these bring those who refuse to have me rule over them into my presence and slay them. He was talking about how he sent all of his messengers out to preach the gospel, inviting them to the wedding feast. Everything is ready. Come to the feast. And they refused to come. They made excuses. And then when they wouldn't come, then he sent his messengers out to the highways and byways to bring any who would come. And then after the feast, everyone was gathered together. He says at the end of this, bring those who refuse to have me and slay them in my presence. That is a part of the subjection of Christ's enemies. You see, they're subjected in two different ways. They are brought in subjection through the gospel. And that brings about, if, if a person responds to it, a change of heart. It causes them willingly to bow their knee before the Lord Jesus Christ, to acknowledge his lordship and to receive him as savior. But there's also that other type of subjection where if you will not have this one to reign over you, then the Lord will destroy you or he will bring a forced subjection. Everything that has happened in the history of the human race from that time into the present has been a part of this subjecting Christ's enemies under his feet. Now we know that it ebbs and flows. There are times when it, when it rises and times when it decreases. And right now we happen to be uh, at one of those times where it seems to be uh, you know, uh, well, weaker than other times. But we do know that it is moving inexorably forward to its conclusion. I mean, as, as poor as the kingdom of heaven may seem right now, it's still a lot bigger and a lot greater than it was when Jesus Christ first came and established it, when it was just him and, and his 12 disciples, one of them not even being a true believer. Since that time, the subjection of his enemies under his feet has been growing. And as that subjection continues, the kingdom continues to grow. And the Bible indicates it will continue to grow until it fills the whole earth. Daniel writes uh, regarding King Nebuchadnezzar's dream as he's interpreting this dream. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Remember Nebuchadnezzar had the dream about the statue and so forth, the different types of metal. And then it showed weakness in the feet because the feet were made of iron mixed with clay. But then there was a stone cut without hands that smashed the feet of the statue and caused it to topple over. A great wind came and scattered all of the, what was left of the statue until there was nothing left except the stone. And the stone grew until it became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. The stone, as Daniel interprets this dream, is the kingdom of God. And one day, this kingdom is going to fill the whole earth. Uh, the Psalms are replete with, with this idea. We read one in our call to worship how all the families of the nations are going to come and worship before the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is filling the earth. And as it fills the earth, it increases in its influence. I believe that's what was behind what Jesus had to say in the parable of the leaven, where he says the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and put in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is something that that works, as it were, its way uh, throughout whatever it is it's, in, it's injected into, in this case, the, uh, the leaven into the flour, until it works its way all the way through, and the whole lump is leavened. The influence of the kingdom begins small, and it eventually permeates the entire earth. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is going to one day be a blessing to all nations, he says that it's like a mustard seed that grows into a great tree so that the birds of the air nest in its branches. Again, the idea is the kingdom begins small, but it eventually becomes so great 
that the kings of the earth seek refuge in its shadow. I do believe that that's what Jesus has in mind when he talks about the birds of the heavens. He's drawing upon that imagery that was used with regard to King Nebuchadnezzar again, where he saw his, in his dream his, his kingdom as a great tree that's branches had spread out and the kings of the earth were like so many birds that were seeking to nest in its branches. I believe our Lord Jesus is basically saying the same thing here, especially when we consider what is written in some of the passages of the Old Testament. David writes in Psalm 86, verse 9, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. I think Isaiah sums it up when he writes this in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. Listen to what he says. Then a shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. I believe this is telling us that Messiah's kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, will become so powerful that it will bring peace and blessing to the whole world. You know, there, it's interesting that... Um, the dispensationalist, the premillennial dispensationalist, believes that the Lord is going to bring this kind of a situation in the millennium after Jesus Christ returns. And what we're saying is that, well, okay, uh, we, we, depending upon how you view these passages, we agree that such a glorious time is coming, but it can't come after he returns because that'll be the end of human history. So it has to take place before he returns. These passages that indicate a situation where we haven't yet entered into the eternal state and where we have this peace even among the animals and there is no more warfare and there is this great peace and blessing and all the nations of the earth worshiping this one who is the stem or the root of Jesse, our Lord Jesus Christ. Messiah's kingdom becomes so powerful that it eventually brings peace and blessing to the whole world. And really, this is fitting that the world that rejected the Lord Jesus Christ should be subjected to him, that the world should see him vindicated as they see the blessings that his reign and subjection to his will actually brings. Now, Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations. The Bible says all the nations of the earth are going to worship before the Lord, apparently, Christ's command is going to be fulfilled. Jesus told his disciples to pray that the kingdom of heaven would come and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 10. Apparently that petition that Jesus taught his church to pray is actually going to be fulfilled. And that should give us a great deal of optimism regarding the future. 
Let me just mention one thing, a point that Edwards brings out, and I'm sure you've seen it displayed on the screen. I don't know whether you had time to read it, um, whether you're here early enough to see it, but you can find it on the back of your bulletins. Now, this is rather abbreviated, but I think it brings across a couple of the points that I wanted us to see. The first one is quite interesting. that has to do with the scriptures and not fully understanding the scriptures, but the other arguments he uses to say that the end of the world was still far away. Well, let's just read what this quote says. It is an argument with me, Jonathan Edwards says, that the world is not yet very near its end, that the church has made no greater progress in understanding the mysteries of the scriptures. The scriptures and all their parts were made for the use of the church here on earth. It seems reasonable to suppose that God will, by degrees, unveil their meaning to his church. Now, the first argument is simply, we don't understand just a portion of the Bible. And since the Lord gave it to us for our good, it seems reasonable that we'd understand it better before he returns. So that's one thing. But now look at the other. Another thing from which you may draw the same conclusion is that it is the manner of God to keep his church on earth in hope of a still more glorious state. And so their prayers are enlivened when they pray that the interest of religion may be promoted and God's kingdom may come. It is a great encouragement to such endeavors to think that such times are coming, wherein Christianity shall prevail over all enemies. And it would be a great discouragement to the labor of nations or pious magistrates and divines to, en to endeavor to advance Christ's kingdom if they understood that it was not to be advanced. And indeed, the keeping alive such hopes in the church has a tendency to enlive all piety and religion in the general amongst God's people. So Edwards is making an argument here that God has promised that these uh, more glorious times are going to come, that there is a great deal of optimism in the, in the future so that the church would pray and labor towards it. He said, if, if our understanding of what God intends to do is not to advance the kingdom much at all, or perhaps not at all, then we're not going to really seek after it or do anything because we know our labors are going to be wasted. But if we know that there is a glorious future ahead of us that he's promised, then it gives to us a great deal of hope to seek after those things. His argument is that God has given us that hope so that we will seek after these things. I think it's an interesting argument, and I think it's a, a valid argument, especially in light of the fact that these passages do seem to indicate that the Lord is going to do something that is much greater than what we have seen to this point. And I think we can all agree, whether we agree it's going to bring the blessings that um, Isaiah was speaking of in Isaiah chapter 11, we all realize that the kingdom of heaven is in some sense going to fill the earth that the nations are in some sense going to be discipled, in some sense the petition that Jesus told us to pray will be fulfilled. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that, again, all these passages that refer to the, all the nations of the earth just worshiping the Lord, streaming into Jerusalem to learn the law from him, uh, seeking the Lord and receiving his blessings under his reign, in some sense, those things have to be fulfilled. And so let your understanding of those things encourage you to seek after the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. Because really, what is the only way that we're going to see any more of the blessings of our Lord Jesus Christ break into history? The only way it's going to happen is through the advancing of his kingdom. Whether you believe then the next event on the horizon is the second coming, or whether you believe that the kingdom of heaven is going to break into this world with power, the way to hasten either of these ends is through evangelism. Because the second coming isn't going to take place until all of his enemies are subdued in whatever sense he means. Until all the elect are gathered in, he can't come to vanquish the last enemy. And if the Lord is in fact going to bring this time of peace and prosperity in the church. It's not going to come in any other way than by advancing the kingdom of heaven. And so if we want to see these things come more quickly, we need to labor to that end. Again, the gospel is the answer to every single difficulty in this world or every single blessing in this world. 
If we want to see more blessing and less difficulties, then advance the kingdom of heaven by giving yourself to do that through your prayers, through your worship, through your sharing your faith with others. Because this is how the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ are subdued. The more you do these things, the more the kingdom of heaven moves forward, the more influence it has on the world. If you want to see more of the Lord's blessings, that is what you need to seek. But don't forget that if you are to do this effectively, you do have to be a part of the kingdom of heaven and share in, as it were, the, the power of that kingdom, the life of that kingdom. You have to be trusting Jesus Christ. And that has to be evidenced in your life by love for the Lord and giving yourself to Him. Otherwise, the power of the kingdom of heaven isn't in you, and you're not going to be able to do what is necessary to advance the kingdom of heaven. You must be filled with the Spirit, and the only way you can do that is by trusting in Jesus Christ. You have to be a believer. You have to turn from your sins. You have to give yourself to the Lord, your whole life, not just part of it, not to seek for your glory, but to seek for His with all the gifts God has given to you, all the resources, and all the opportunities. Now next time we're going to look at what some believe is standing in the way of the idea that the Lord could do something like this in our lifetime because doesn't it appear in Scripture that difficult times are ahead? Doesn't it seem at least the majority of the church believe that, um, you know, that, well, again, the idea that we're going downhill, isn't there a great deal of persecution and judgment and things like that in the future that sort of exclude the idea of, of the kingdom of heaven actually bringing blessing to the world? Well, we'll look at some of the reasons why people believe that and the reasons why we should not believe that, but rather we should have an optimistic view of the future. Let's uh, bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to take some of the things we've seen and encourage us.